morning, everyone. Earlier today, House Democrats uh, met with Secretary Javier Becerra. And it was an illustration of the two different approaches that House Democrats and House Republicans are taking as it relates to solving problems with the American people. House Democrats met with Secretary Becerra to talk about implementation of our efforts to negotiate lower drug prices for everyday Americans, to strengthen access to affordable health care, uh, and to discuss our efforts around things like capping the cost of insulin for everyday Americans at $35 a month. That's how House Democrats spent this morning. House Republicans spent this morning talking about their illegitimate impeachment inquiry, which is nothing more than a partisan political stunt, because there's no evidence of wrongdoing with respect to President Biden. And they spent the morning talking about shutting down the government, which will crash the economy and hurt everyday Americans. House Democrats are going to continue to put people over politics. That's our focus. That's our agenda. That's our belief in what members of Congress should be doing here in Washington. People over politics. Fighting for lower costs and better paying jobs and safer communities and growing the middle class. What's the House Republican agenda, the extreme MAGA Republican agenda, shut down the government, crash the economy, illegitimately impeach President Joe Biden, and jam their right-wing ideology down the throats of the American people, including marching America toward a nationwide abortion ban. Questions? Mr. Leader, just to pick back off of that, I mean, I know that you call it a stunt, but can you talk more concretely about Democrats' strategy to counter this impeachment inquiry? Is it messaging? Is it trying to block their records requests or subpoenas? And then secondly, based on what you know, do you think Hunter Biden's conduct is defensible? The Hunter Biden matter is pending before a court. There's ongoing litigation, and so there's nothing further uh, for me to add to that case. With respect to President Biden, there is no evidence, not a shred of evidence, that President Biden engaged in wrongdoing. There is not a shred of evidence that President Biden committed an impeachable offense. There is not a shred of evidence that President Biden broke the law. This illegitimate impeachment inquiry is a partisan political stunt, period, full stop. Why are we dealing with it? Because Donald Trump in ordered the Supreme, the extreme MAGA Republicans to launch the impeachment inquiry. That's it. That's the reason. And so our approach is going to be to present the facts and the truth to the American people. Are you confident that Vice President Harris proper running for Joe Biden in 2024 and, and express your support or, or do you think there's some issues? Yes, she absolutely uh, is the right running mate for President Biden, and she's done a phenomenal job as vice president, particularly when it comes to leaning in to our values as Democrats with respect to a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. Vice President Harris has made clear uh, that we're going to continue to build an economy that works for everyday Americans, and we're going to do that together. Uh, Vice President Harris has made clear that we believe in truth and reconciliation, as opposed to some of the extremists on the other side of the aisle who want to erase African American history. Second one, um, on the UAW strike, are you planning on attending a picket line this weekend? And what do you think automakers need to do in order to avoid a strike? It's my hope that there can be a resolution reached uh, that 
provides the UAW workers uh, with the dignity and respect on the job that they deserve. Here in America, um, everyone who works hard, like the UAW workers do each and every day, uh, deserves to be able to earn a comfortable living for themselves and for their families, to educate their children, to purchase a home, and to one day be able to retire with grace and with dignity. And it's my strong hope that any contract resolution that is reached uh, affirms that basic principle, which is connected to the American middle class dream. So will you be attending a picket line this weekend? Let's see what happens in terms of whether they move forward or not with any kind of work action. Uh, but to the extent that that occurs, I'll, I'll certainly have more to say as it relates to my solidarity with the UAW workers. Given how little progress has been made this week in the House in connection with spending bills. Are you concerned that there's not going to be an ability to reach a short-term spending agreement? House Republicans have made clear that they are determined to shut down the government and try to jam their extreme right-wing ideology down the throats of the American people. We believe, as House Democrats, that we should continue to find common ground and it also appears that Senate Republicans share our views as well. And so you have House Democrats, Senate Republicans, Senate Democrats, and President Biden and the administration all in lockstep that we reached an agreement as it relates to spending levels that provide for the health, the safety, and the economic well-being of the American people. It was passed into law. It was bipartisan in nature. House Democrats overwhelmingly supported that agreement. It's an agreement that protected Social Security, protected Medicare, protected Medicaid, protected veterans, protected public education. And we believe that we should stick with that agreement. Extreme MAGA Republicans are the only ones in Washington, D.C., who are trying to breach that agreement as part of their effort to undermine the health, the safety, the economic well-being of the American people because they want to jam their extreme right-wing ideology down the throats of everyday Americans by doing things like restricting the ability of women in the military to be able to make their own reproductive health care decisions if they are in restrictive states. That's none of the business of these right-wing politicians. But that's one of the reasons why they're marching us toward a government shutdown. And it's wrong. Heather? Uh, Speaker McCarthy actually said this morning that he does want to put a CR on the floor now, uh, kind of going against these hardliners that you were just talking about. He doesn't want to shut down. Have you talked to the Speaker in the last day or so about a CR and what Democrats would need to support that? I have not talked to Speaker McCarthy yet. Uh, about a continuing resolution this week. I have spoken to Leader Schumer, and we're both in agreement that the only way forward is a bipartisan path that funds the government at the current fiscal year levels and deals with some of the requests that President Biden has made with respect to disaster relief funding, funding the effort in Ukraine, and also dealing with the border security dynamics in terms of making sure that the requests made by the Biden administration are addressed. Thanks, Leader Jeffries. What are the sticking points for Democrats when it comes to the defense appropriations bill? With the NDAA, um, while the um, amendment that would have prohibited funding for DEI office uh, was passed. It, um, the amendment that uh, would have prohibited uh, funding for any DEI failed. So there is that loophole where DEI could still be taught in the military. So what are the issues for Democrats when it comes to the defense appropriations bill? Is it the travel for abortion? Uh, the defense appropriations bill is a non-starter uh, for a variety of reasons, focused primarily on the fact that the legislation is not designed to ensure 
that our military is in a state of readiness. The Republicans are using the defense appropriations bill to jam their extreme right-wing ideology down the throats of military women, men, and families. That is wrong. And by the way, the last time I checked, they can't even bring the defense appropriations bill to the floor because they've totally lost control of the floor to the extremists who are running the House Republican Conference. That's why they're shutting down the government. That's why they're trying to impeach the president illegitimately as part of a partisan political stunt. House Republicans are being driven by the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene, George Santos, and Donald Trump. That's who's running the circus right now. And it is a three-ring circus. In ring one, shut down the government. Ring two, impeach President Biden. Ring three, jam your extreme right-wing ideology down the throats of the American people. So the American people right now are seeing a clear contrast. House Democrats are fighting to make life better for everyday Americans. More money, more time, more freedom. More money in your pockets, more time with your children and your families, more freedom, including the freedom to make your own reproductive health care decisions. House Republicans are fighting each other. And you know what it means for everyday Americans? More chaos, more dysfunction, and more extremism. It's sad, it's dangerous, and it's pathetic. What are examples of yeah. the issues that the Democrats have with the Treasury? Thank you, Senator Jeffries. Uh, so the Treasury is reporting a $1.5 trillion deficit for the first 11 months of the fiscal year, and that doesn't include, I believe, the estimates that were coming from the student loan forgiveness plan that was struck down. It, do you believe that's a sign that our current spending levels are not sustainable? I think President Biden submitted a budget uh, that was designed to do several things. One, uh, to protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare. Two, uh, to reduce the deficit and address our nation's debt. And three, build an economy that works for everyday Americans, that grows the middle class, that's built uh, from the middle out and the bottom up. If we continue to be able to grow our economy, as President Biden has done, up until this date, that will allow us to address many of the fiscal challenges that are before us. But we also need to look at making sure that every American, every corporation pays their fair share. And I think that's also part of the discussion that should occur as we move forward. The Republicans blew a dramatic hole in our deficit and skyrocketed our nation's debt in 2017 when they passed the GOP tax scam. 83% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1% in the United States of America, subsidizing the lifestyles of the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected, and exploded the debt by $2 trillion and forced everyday Americans to pay for it. Now, many of the provisions from the 2017 GOP tax scam expire in about two years. And we'll have an opportunity to take a real close look at that dynamic and to help right our fiscal ship. Back row. A, a federal judge recently uh, called the DACA program illegal. U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, religious organizations are calling for immigration reform. Do you see any sort of type of momentum that Democrats can do to bring immigration reform? Uh, we clearly have a broken immigration system, uh, and we need to fix it and do so in a bipartisan way, and do it in a manner that is consistent with two principles. One. America is a nation of immigrants. It's what gives us a lot of our economic strength and competitiveness and dynamism. We also are a nation anchored in the principle of the rule of law. 
uh, and we have to make sure that we can strengthen our security at the border. And we want to do both as Democrats, but certainly do it in a humane and compassionate way that, of course, respects the principles of our country as a nation anchored in the rule of law. And it's unfortunate because the extreme MAGA Republicans at this moment uh, have no interest in addressing any issues at the border. They have no interest uh, in addressing our immigration system because they just want to play partisan political games in the area of immigration and in many other areas as well. You saw House Democrats file another discharge petition this week on gun violence. Uh, in light of the DACA ruling, are Democrats planning on filing any discharge petitions on immigration? We're focused right now and have had no discussions uh, with respect to the most recent DACA ruling, but will. This week, our focus with respect to the discharge petition is on addressing the gun violence epidemic that we confront in the United States of America. And again, there are clear contrasts here. As House Democrats, we want to continue to find common ground with the other side of the aisle, whenever and wherever possible, to address the challenges that affect the day-to-day -day lives of the American people. That relates to the economy, that relates to lowering costs, that relates to reproductive freedom, that relates to safer communities, it relates to the climate crisis, it relates to providing disaster relief to people in Hawaii or Vermont or Florida. Doesn't matter whether you live in a so-called red state or blue state, we're all Americans, all impacted by extreme weather events and the climate crisis, and it certainly is focused on addressing the gun violence epidemic. We want to find common ground with the other side of the aisle on all of those issues. But the extreme MAGA Republicans are, again, focused on the wrong things. They're focused on shutting down the government, illegitimately pursuing an impeachment inquiry with respect to President Biden. And in terms of the defense bill and all the other appropriations bills, as opposed to proceeding in a bipartisan way, which is exactly what the Senate Republicans and the Senate Democrats are doing at this moment, responsibly. The extreme mega Republicans are focused on loading up these appropriations bills with their right-wing ideological wish list. And that is why the House is unable to function at this moment under extreme mega Republican leadership and why we believe they are barreling the American people toward a government shutdown that may crash the economy and certainly will hurt everyday Americans. Because Thank you, um, a few weeks ago, Representative Dean Phillips was very vocal about someone coming out to challenge President Biden, worried about his age, poll numbers, et cetera. You had a conversation with him. He has not been vocal since. So what was your advice to him? I think I said the same things uh, privately that I've said publicly, which is that I strongly support President Biden. He has an incredible track record of success and accomplishments on behalf of the American people, including the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Clean Water in Every Community, the Chips and Science Act, bringing domestic manufacturing jobs back home to the United States of America, and the Inflation Reduction Act, where we lowered the cost of insulin to $35 an hour, and that I am going to continue to keep the focus on the track record of accomplishments that is extraordinary that President Biden has achieved, his vision for the future to really bring the American dream to life in every single zip code, and the danger that the extreme MAGA Republicans and Donald Trump present to this nation. Do you worry that it's dividing the party, uh, President Biden's reelection running again? No. Thanks.
Um, yeah, First row, get there. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on the farm bill deadline. It's coming up. Uh, we heard that Congressman Glenn J.T. Thompson, he says that he thinks that an extension may be necessary. Uh, do you also agree with that? Are there any priorities that you think should be included in the farm bill? And you can, can also get your reaction to uh, the news out of NASA this morning saying they have not found evidence that UAPs are active for hospital. Um, I haven't seen that particular uh, report, but uh, look forward to evaluating it. Um, in terms of the Farm Bill, uh, this has been a legislative area where in the past, Democrats and Republicans have worked together. And it's our continued hope that we'll be able to do that to support our nation's farmers and to support the need to meet the nutritional needs of the American people all across America, in urban America, in rural America, in suburban America, in exurban America, in small town America, in the heartland of America, and in Appalachia. The Farm Bill should not be a divisive area. It is fertile ground for cooperation and for common ground and for coming together. The only problem that we confront now is that the extreme mega Republicans want to hijack the farm bill and to take it in a certain direction, inconsistent with meeting the needs of farmers and the American people. And we will oppose that every step of the way. So do you think an extension is necessary? We'll evaluate that the closer we get to the deadline. Thanks. Third row. Um, when asked today, uh to Speaker McCarthy, he said he's not quite sure what uh, his caucus wants and how they want to proceed um, about the funding the government. So I'm wondering what your thoughts on that and uh, what that, uh, that says to you. He's not wrong uh, in terms of the schizophrenic nature of some of the demands that have been made by House Republicans. The one point of commonality is that it's all extreme. It's just different levels of extremism. But it's all extreme, and it's not focused on finding common ground with us, which is what the American people would like to see happen. We reached a bipartisan agreement. More than 300 members of the House supported the resolution of the default crisis and set top-line spending numbers designed to meet the needs of the American people. President Biden is committed to adhering to that agreement. House Democrats are committed to adhering to that agreement. Senate Republicans are committed to adhering to that agreement. Senate Democrats are committed to adhering to that agreement. What's the problem? It's obvious. The extreme MAGA Republicans. And so hopefully, they will work it out so that we avoid a catastrophic government shutdown. But again, while we're focused on fighting for everyday Americans, the extreme bank of Republicans are focused on fighting each other. The caucus members have demonstrated that they're more than willing to kill rule votes. Are Democrats willing to, as you did with the debt ceiling deal, vote for a Republican leadership rule on a bipartisan Senate negotiated CR or appropriations bill? Extreme mega Republicans temporarily hold the gavels. The extreme mega Republicans are responsible for passing the rule. Kevin? Switching back to the immigration conversation, um, is there anything that you think the White House can be doing that they're not when it comes to migrants in New York? And when it comes to some of the rhetoric you've seen, it's really the mayor using this description of destroying the city. Uh, when it comes to just democratic messaging in New York, do you try to flip those districts around New York City? Could this undermine this or complicate that effort? I had a very positive conversation with uh, Mayor Adams over the weekend uh, about finding a path forward. We all agree uh, that we need to substantively do everything possible to address the migrant situation in New York. The congressional delegation on the Democratic side has been very clear 
that we believe one of the paths forward is to make sure that the migrants are temporarily authorized to be able to work in New York City or beyond while they are waiting a final determination on their asylum applications. It's logical. It makes sense. The American people support the fact that while people are going through the immigration process, waiting for a final determination on asylum, uh, they should be able to work so they can take care of themselves and their families. It's a logical way forward. There are some obstacles that exist under the law in that regard, but we're committed to working with the Biden administration to try to see what legal avenues are available to temporarily provide work authorizations as the asylum applicants await a determination. With respect to whether New York City is going to be able to manage the situation, New York City is always able to manage whatever moment, whatever, whatever disturbance, whatever crisis impacts us. Never count out New York City. People counted out New York City during the 1970s fiscal crisis. We overcame it. People counted out New York City during the midst of the crack cocaine epidemic, 2,000 plus homicides every year, murder capital of the world, some said. We overcame it. People counted out New York City when the towers were struck, impacting lower Manhattan and the financial district, thousands of lives tragically lost, fire department devastated. We overcame it. People counted out New York when the Great Recession struck and hit us particularly hard because the financial services industry was affected, the real estate industry was affected, the insurance industry was affected, three important industries to the heart and soul of New York. We overcame it. People counted out New York City when Superstorm Sandy struck. We overcame it. People counted out New York City when the pandemic hit and we were ground zero. We overcame it. People counted us out when the Brooklyn Dodgers left. And we overcame it. New York City will always <laughs> overcome it. The Mets. That's right. Sure about that. I'm a Yankees fan, but I stick by the Mets. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.